topic is how do I become the saint? How do you become the saint? And I think one way to look at this is look at what did the saints themselves say about becoming a saint in the easiest, quickest way. And um, I'll just read a few of them. Then I'm going to talk really about three saints tonight and what they had to say about um, how to become holy, how to become a saint, how to live uh, our lives. Um, St. John Bosco, he said, it's by obedience. And obedience is not only the sum total of spiritual perfection, it is also the easiest, safest, surest, quickest way of growing in holiness and gaining heaven itself. Pope St. Pius X, he wrote, by Holy Communion, it's the best way. His Holy Communion is the shortest and safest way to heaven. There are others, innocents, but that is for little children. Penance, but we are afraid of it. Generous endurance, the trials of life. When they come, we weep and ask to be relieved of them. The surest, easiest way, the shortest way is the Holy Eucharist. And then the last one is the Blessed Virgin Mary. St. Louis de Montfort said, the Blessed Mother is the safest, easiest, shortest, and most perfect way of approaching Jesus. So we'll talk about St. Louis de Montfort a bit later. The well, three saints I am going to talk about are um, St. Ignatius Loyola, St. Uh, Louis de Montfort, and St. Teresa of Lisieux. And they're all lived in a chronological order. St. Um, Ignatius Loyola died in 1536. He was a founder of the Jesuits, and there's a variety of Jesus. And um, I'm going to read you his first foundation, first of all, foundation, which is kind of the um, little mandate of the order. And this order, you know, they came about at a time in Spain, they found it in Spain, then he went to Rome, and it grew rapidly in the, in the 1500s. And it was a great, it really saved the church in many ways, because in Northern Europe, in uh, England, Germany, other countries, the faith is being wracked by Lutheranism and by you know, Henry VIII in England and so on, and the revolution is happening throughout the world, and um, nothing had to be done. And so God raised up these order of men, and they were a different kind of order because up until that time, most orders were living in monasteries. I mean, if you weren't like the Franciscans and the Dominicans, but often they were still living behind monastery walls where they could be protected and where they could work on their spiritual life and their growth. These men were really sent into the world. Often they went alone too, by themselves. And who were some of these great saints of the, of the Jesuits in the early days? People like St. Francis Xavier, who left um, um, Spain. He went to India, and mainly India had great success, baptizing, we think, maybe between 100,000 and 200,000 people by himself. I mean, that's incredible. He got to die off the coast of China, six miles off the coast of China, wanted to go there, but he didn't make it. He was only 52 years old when he died. In Japan, St. Paul Miki was a, a Japanese convert and he became a Jesuit priest. He and 25 others were crucified in Nagasaki in 1597. And again, the faith had gone that far. The English martyrs, like St. Edmund Campion, who were drawn and quartered, you know, in the late 1500s by Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth and so on. So we have these great saints. And even Lenin, you know, the head of the, uh, began the Communist Party in, in, in Russia, said if I had 10 men, like those earliest Jesuits, I could conquer the world. And that's how great was their fervor and their life. I want to read to you just their, their mandate, of, uh, which is very simple, but also very powerful in, um, in what uh, Ignatius wrote. Oh, I lost it here somewhere. He wrote, I'm going to say man. A man here means man and women. It doesn't mean just man, but he uses man all through the sentence. So, but it means man and women. A man is created to praise, reverence, and serve God our Lord. But this means to save his soul. The other things on the face of the earth are created for man to help him in attaining the end for which he is created. Hence, man is to make use of them as far as they help him in the attainment of his end. He must rid himself of them insofar as it prove a hindrance to him. Therefore, we must make ourselves different of all created things, as far as we are allowed free choice and are not under any prohibition. Consequently, as far as we are concerned, we should not prefer health to sickness, riches to poverty, honor to dishonor, a long life to a short life. The same holds true for all other things. Our one desire should be and choice should be that which is most conducive to the end for which we are created. 
God made us to come to heaven. You know, I remember in the old um, uh, catechism. And so we get the Jesuits, and then we have many Marian saints over, over time who I want to talk about about the Virgin Mary as a, as a um, one who really forms us and helps us to become like Christ. The Luda Montour had the line to me. He says, uh, Marian devotion is the surest, easiest, shortest, most perfect way of becoming a saint. And he predicted after he only died at the age of 43, he died in 1716, he was a French priest, and he, um, he had these manuscripts written about uh, consecrating ourselves to Mary, but he predicted well, when he died, they would be lost for a time. They would be, the demons would come, try to destroy them, get rid of them because they, they hate what he had done. And he wrote this, he wrote this, he said, I clearly see that raging beasts will come in fury to tear with their diabolical teeth this little writing. Release to smother it in the darkness and silence of a coffin that it may not appear. And this was true. It happened that for 100 years, the writings were, were lost. They were rediscovered and published, and then had great success in uh, in Mary devotion growing in, in later times. And um, we on to say that these writings would help form some of the greatest saints in the history of the church. And it really means into our time, people that are, uh, he saw it. Division, he saw a great army of saints, and uh, he said, The greatest saints will come at the end of time, and they will be formed by the Blessed Mother. And he said, They often will be little people, like little people, like St. Teresa talked about, a little and humble, maybe unknown to the world, but they are living for the Lord very powerfully. And uh, I think we know we're living in times that are very perilous and dangerous and uh, difficult for the faith. You know, we see in our times uh, wars. You know, in places like the Middle East, ISIS, and um, you know, in sectors like Ebola, we see wars and so on, and in other countries, tensions in Russia, Ukraine. Um, we see all kinds of trouble. We see in our own country the scourge of abortion and uh, many social ills and addictions and uh, all kinds of things. And um, so what? Um, so what can we do? We we think what what can happen? Well, St. Paul writes in Romans 5:20 the beautiful line. He says. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. We're really saying that where, where evil increases and increases and increases, that God's grace increases as well powerfully to help people in perilous times. And Thomas More, who was the head of Hendrides in 1535 uh, in England, he said, Times are never so evil that good men cannot live in them. Men, men and women. Times are never so evil that good people cannot live in them. So he's saying that too. No matter how bad things are, we can still live for the Lord wherever we are in, in our times. And um, so Mary in devotion, he says, encourages us to um, dedicate ourselves to our blessed mother. So it's, a, it's a secret of his writings. And um, it's wherever we are, God has a plan, some plan, and some work to us. We're all, we're all created for a reason. I mean, each of us for a task to provide to do something for him in the world. We're not just here kind of real accidents that happen, you know, maybe we're from a big family, lot number nine or ten, uh, just happened by chance. None of us happened by chance. It's all by God's plan that we're here and that we're here in this time and place. We're born, wherever we were born, that was God's plan. The family we were born into, that was God's plan. If you don't think, well, I wish I had a different family than the life that I have, but that was the plan of God to place you, where he placed all of us in life. And so, um, So God uniquely blessed Mary by giving her this role of becoming the mother of the Messiah. So her first, his great gift, firstly, is to become the mother of the Messiah. She says yes. And um, she really gave um, the permission of the Holy Spirit to conceive Jesus in her. So it's really a spousal union. She's like the bride of the Holy Spirit. She's a spouse of the Holy Spirit in a marital kind of union. And that doesn't just end. Okay, now Jesus born it continues. And the Holy Spirit remains and are with her through all time and work through her for all time as well. And um, again, we see that uh, Mary, so Mary had many gifts given to her. She was blessed by being born without original sin, Max of Conception. She also was given many um, blessings throughout her life. Much of her life was hidden. You know, Mary don't hear too much about her. So she's kind of a hidden person. And uh, you know, 
be the mind like just so dull and boring and whatever, and I'm just doing what? Ordinary things. In ordinariness is the road to holiness, and especially in a time like ours where you know, we look, you know, there's so much competition to get into university, to get a new job. Uh, so for young people, it's so difficult. And yet, what God would say, you don't need to do all those kind of things. You need to live in me, and that can be a very humble life. You can be a very holy of being humble and simple. We look at other modern saints, Saint uh, Brother Andre, who was a saint of Montreal, who was a doorkeeper. And you know, when he came, it was a you know, Holy Cross order, Holy Cross priests and brothers, or a teaching order, they were very smart guys. They thought, well, Brother Andre, you know, kind of did what you know, what are we going to do with it? He can enter the door, basically, and so over there for 40 years, he was a doorkeeper. But being a doorkeeper, well, he had time to talk with the people they are waiting for somebody more important to come down, but he would talk with them, they'd tell them their, their life, oh, you know, I've got problems, he would pray with them, and they would often be healed. And this is kind of how the story went. In Detroit, there was another very similar man. Uh, he's not a Canada chap, his name is uh, Father, um, what's his name, uh, Casey. Um, Training house. So long as Casey, uh, his name, kind of very similar to Brother Roderick, he was a doorkeeper at a, at a different order in Detroit. And the same kind of thing, he was a doorkeeper, a holy man, and uh, kind of unknown to, to many people, but loved by the Lord. He became a saint. So we're saying in modern times, you know, by an ordinary, ordinary people, it can become very holy in doing what they do very well for God. Just do it the best you can. He became very holy, washing dishes. You know, doing the laundry, uh, making dinner can be a way to great holiness for, for people. And we often think, well, uh, that's the ordinary. Anybody can do that, but do it with great love for God and for others. You know, that's all that's asked of us, you know, in this. Okay, and coming back to um, the Mary here now. And uh, the Mary was given at the cross for this great gift where the Lord said to her, the John, the disciple, uh, woman, behold your son. And John, behold your mother. Now we're told then that uh, from there on he took her into his home. Really means not into, into his heart, into his life. So, and there she becomes our mother as well. And her role as a mother, uh, which went with Jesus, now is to form us into other Christ. Her role is to form Jesus into holiness from her role as much as she could. Now that role is given to her to form us into holy people as well. So now she becomes our mother as well, to form us into her son. The more we cooperate with that, the more things will happen. Um, St. Louis de Montreal Consecration has two major emphases. First, we're renewing our baptismal vows and giving ourselves to Mary. Now, renewing our vows, we also um, renounce Satan. You know, East, we do have baptisms, and also at, um, every year at Easter, we do that as well. We renounce Satan and his palms and works and, uh, and give ourselves to God. Now, so Satan is, is mentioned there. It's interesting because he hates Mary, he can't stand her, and in many ways, he hates her more than God even, because Satan being very proud and arrogant, well, at least God, the Father, powerful, you know, being knocked out by God, okay, but, but here's Mary, the humble, and made of the Lord, a woman, and she's humble and sinful and holy, she's stronger than he is. To him, that's horrible, like, I mean, that's the most worst uh, thing he could have happened to him, and yet he knows that she is his great enemy, and she's successful over him. So again, just to uh, encourage uh, married devotion, you know, it's really growing again. And you know, there are books around today, like, um, well, you from this, uh, you can find all kinds of books. Preparation for Total Consecration, according to St. Louis de Montreal. And here's another book that's used a lot. We use it in St. Luke's. It's called 33 Days of Morning Glory. It's a really easy book to use. Again, it's 33 days of prayers, and they're simple prayers, two of pages every day. Consecrating ourselves to Mary, and again, it really helps us understand about her and her role in her life. And just to encourage that in our time, we have these books. You know, you, they're about eighteen dollars. But Lighthouse Media, if you have any of that in your parish, parishes, you get them for next to nothing, really, because they really want to spread these. Kind of, they, not just this book, but many books they are spreading in your parishes, and um, many parishes are using Lighthouse Media for that. You get them as cheap as two dollars if you get them the biggest amount. So. He has a regular book. St. Teresa of Lisieux, another uh, last saint. Uh, she talked about, I want to talk about purgatory and St. Teresa of Lisieux. In her convent, this is like 1897 when she died. She was head of the novices, even though she was a young, a young sister. And her, um, her role was, you know, to teach them. And she was teaching the sisters, like, 
that time in France, maybe around the world, it was kind of believed among Catholics that when you die, even if you're a really good person, you're probably going to purgatory for a time. You're gonna, you have to be so holy to go right to heaven. And she began to think, in her, she began to think that she doesn't seem right. If God is all merciful, all loving, does He want us to go to purgatory? And so she began to teach her sisters that you don't have to go to purgatory. You can go straight to heaven. You know, if you trust totally in God, trust in God and in, in, in His and in His mercy. Uh, you say to God, you know, I give you everything, everything that I have is yours. I have nothing, I come before you as a, as a beggar with nothing. And everything we give back to God. And, and in that, God sees great merit and great holiness. And so it's really trusting in the mercy of God, divine mercy, trusting in that, living in that. And um, so she, you know, she told her sisters, no, you can just you can go aim for heaven, go aim for purgatory, because you might end up there. One sister, one of her sister said to Sri Teresa, you're teaching heresy, so you shouldn't be teaching such nonsense. Teresa talked to her said, no, I believe I'm right. I believe I'm, this is correct. But she believed that she, her own father was very loving. You know, she had a good relationship with her father, her own natural father. We translate into her seeing God like her father, a loving father. Well, her loving father sent his gifts to purgatory if he didn't have to. You know, purgatory is a case of mercy, but if you don't have to go there, why go there? Why not I aim right for heaven? Anyhow, the sister who had talked with her and told her she was uh, teaching heresy and died. And then she appeared to her in a dream and said to her, uh, Teresa, said, Teresa, you were right. And I'm in purgatory. And please pray for me. I could have gone right to heaven if I believed in that. It's like we don't trust God enough. We just trust, I'm bad. God's going to send me there because I'm bad. We don't trust enough in the mercy of God that we can go straight there. It's kind of like, um, you know, if one of our students, you know, like if we're a lazy student, like maybe in high school or university, you no, know, I'm happy to get a C. I just need to see the path, get a good path. Uh, even a C minus, that's good. But if we only need for that, you know, we might miss it. We might end up with a D and we'll fail and uh, we miss the mark. And so we should aim high all the time. It means to live a Christian life the best, you know, not to be a mediocre Christian, but to really serve God and neighbor. And in some ways, it's sort of easy. I mean, it's um, uh, kind of simple rules and, uh, of God and neighbor. Great commandment is loving God and our neighbor. And if we do that, everything is completed. And uh, so I think these three saints have a lot to say, and uh, even much to our modern times. And they try to make it easier for us and, uh, and simple because our times, again, are very complicated. And, um, you know, we see this in uh, you know, trying to keep up with technology. Well, you know, I'm going to keep up with it. And if you're older like me, well, you your cell phone, that's about it. You know, I need a computer. Don't do much more than that, and, um, but it's, you know, every year it's changing and can't keep up and that kind of thing. So anyhow, I think we should be really encouraged by the saints to, uh, yes, we can go to heaven right away. We can go there. It's aimed to be saints. It's aimed to be, you know, as in, in your own holiness. That can be very, doesn't have to be doing great things. It just means doing little things with great love. And it means forgiving our neighbor. Don't hold a resentful heart towards anybody in our life. People that we knew in the past, people that are dead, don't hold an anger against them. Really work at uh, you know, pulling out your hatred or your, your anger, your unforgiveness toward others. That is truly helpful in getting straight to heaven when, when we die. So uh, let's aim for heaven, not for purgatory. But if we get to purgatory, that's still really good too, because if we get there, we're, we're going to heaven, but we're just going to have to wait a while. So it's a good place too. It's a place over here, it's a place of God's mercy and God's love as well that we end up there.